And uh, first, Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Gerald Hale will welcome people on behalf of the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And Gerald has been a part of the leadership team for four years. He's going into his fifth. And you should know this about him. His area of academic expertise is communications. So this is a, a meaningful event for him. And I'll turn it over to Gerald. Thank you very much. Uh, is the microphone on? Mm -hmm. okay, it's working. Great. Is the green light on? Well, good evening, and let me add my welcome is to that, that Dr. Ellington. I want to welcome you to the signature event of Constitution Day at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, the 13th annual Richard Brooks Walker Constitution Day Lecture and Symposium. At a time when civic engagement is at an historic ebb, and people across the political spectrum voice concerns for our democracy, the Grutzbacher Lecture has never been more important than it is this year. Mm -hmm. You've heard the old adage that those who can't do teach. <laughs> And those who don't teach administrate. Absolutely. At a time when civic engagement is at an historic ebb and people across the political spectrum have voiced concerns for our democracy, the Grutzmacher Lecture has never been more important than it is this year. I'm pleased that we have a sizable audience on campus and that the lecture is also being streamed to an even wider audience. The Institute of American Civics is an important sponsor of this event and it's affiliated with the Howard H. Baker Jr. School of Politics and Public Affairs at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. The Institute is a bipartisan result of legislation passed in 2022 by the Tennessee General Assembly. Its mission is to strengthen civic education and participation while promoting thoughtfulness, civility, and respect for opposing viewpoints and national discourse. Again, to our audience members here and watching us uh, in the live stream, um, thank you for joining us for this important symposium and this important event. Dr. Lucian, Lucian Ellington, director of the Center for Reflective Citizenship, will make remarks about Constitution Day, recognize sponsors who support this year's program, introduce the speakers, and explain the format for tonight's symposium. Dr. Ellington. Again, welcome to the 13th annual Richard Grutzenacher Constitution Day Lecture Series. And this year, a symposium. And I want to do three things in a short period of time. One, Constitution Day. We put brochures outside, and I hope everyone picked one up. It'll save time so we can get to the symposium. But Constitution Day became a federal law in 2004 as a result of bipartisan legislation of the Congress. And any college and university who receives federal funds is obligated to host Constitution Day educational programs commemorating September 17th, and that's the day that the framers of the Constitution signed the document in Philadelphia. So that's an overview of Constitution Day. I also gratefully thank this year's sponsors, including the UT Institute of American Civics, the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga College of Health, Education and Professional Studies, the Scott L. Probasco Distinguished Chair of Free Enterprise, and the Jack C. Miller Center for Teaching America's Founding Principles in History. I also ask the family members of the late Richard Grutzmacher 
a highly respected UTC professional staff member and faculty who loved American history and got his start as a junior high American history teacher. And so the lecture is, is, is now named in his honor and would the Grutzmacher family please stand. introduce briefly the speakers and they share a couple of things in common. They both have good senses of humor. That's a nice thing to do if one is trying to promote civility in discussions where uh, there may be differing opinions. And our primary speaker tonight, Joshua Dunn, is the inaugural executive director of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville Institute of American Civics. And he's published in Constitutional Law and History, Educational Policy, Federalism, Freedom of Speech and Religion. He writes columns on education reform, and his publications have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times. John B. Jack Zilbuck, he caught my attention because he describes himself as a recovering journalist. I love that. <laughs> so I research Jack. And he is the Massingale, as in Luther Massingale, if some of you remember him, professor, professor of communication at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. He teaches a course on media history, including a, a unit on the First Amendment. And he balances his academic career with professional journalism. And his columns have appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education. He won the National Press Photographer's Garland Educator of the Year Award. And, and there he has many other accomplishments as well. And the last thing that I'll do before we start is frame the, is frame the, the lecture and the symposium. Professor Dunn will speak for approximately 30, 35 minutes. Professor Zilbuck will pose questions for six to seven minutes. And what we, you'll see, if, if you look, you'll see stationary mics on both co corners. And one of the things we've had continually through Constitution Day are robust question and answer sessions. So we want the audience to have a good 30 minutes, at least, to ask questions of either or both speakers. But what we, we ask you to do is please don't come to the mic without a, a question ready, to, ready in your mind to ask. And we really don't welcome speeches. And we also don't welcome any personal attacks on any speaker. In other words, focus upon the topic. We're modeling, we're trying to model what productive and, and fruitful exchanges of opinion can do for society. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to our first speaker. And Thank you so much, Lucian. It is an honor to be with you. Um, and I also want to thank the university for having me. Uh, so this is my first time in Chattanooga. What a beautiful city. Uh, and so it's great to be here. Thank you also to the Center for Re uh, Reflective Citizenship uh, for hosting this event on such, such an important topic. So uh, my comments will largely focus on higher education and free speech tonight. I'll say a little bit about the media. I know that that's it, uh, in there, but much of this will focus on higher education. But uh, before getting into it, I do want to say that I, I don't think I'm picking on higher education here, uh, even though I think that there are significant problems related to free speech on university campuses today. I think that the things that we see on university campuses, we also see in broader society. In fact, some of my own research shows this. A um, friend of mine and I uh, did a study where what we found was that general members of the public were uh, 
almost as willing to censor controversial speech as college students. Uh, so this is something that affects, I, I think, affects all of us. It just so happens, though, that the university is the place where you should see free speech being modeled and uh, reflected in its activities uh, and not being, uh, not being suppressed. Uh, but um, but we, see, we do see more of that today. I also want to say that free speech is something both very natural uh, and also unnatural. Uh, it's natural because I think all of us have, an, have the desire to express our own opinions and not to be stifled when we, express, uh, when we express those opinions. But it's unnatural in the sense that we don't like being told that we're wrong. Uh, and that's what free speech entails, that others can tell us uh, that they disagree with us. I don't know that many of us woke up this morning and just said, boy, I'd really love to run into someone who just thinks I'm fundamentally incorrect on some things that I hold very dear. <laughs> Any of you do that? I didn't, right? Uh, so this is something that has to be taught to each new generation, and universities should play a central role in doing this. So I want to describe some of the problems that we see regarding free speech or some evidence that we see that free speech is not being sufficiently nurtured and protected on uh, campuses today, and then talk about some of the main reasons for that, uh, and then reflect on some of the things that we might be able to, to do to improve that situation. So just this summer, there was a survey that came out from the Institute for Global Innovation and Growth's annual American College Student Freedom Progress and Flourishing Survey. And this survey found, they asked students this question, if a professor says something that students find offensive, should that professor or class instructor be reported to the university? 74% said yes, it should be reported. Now there was an interesting ideological breakdown, but we can talk about how maybe this has shifted over time. I don't want people to engage in self-congratulation here because it has changed over time. But 81% of liberal students said that, 76% of independent students said that, and then 53% of conservatives uh, said that. Uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, organization that used to be called the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, they have done a series of surveys over several years trying to gauge student attitudes on freedom of speech and also faculty, I'll mention in, as well in a minute. Uh, but here's some of their recent findings from some of their surveys. One survey found that 57% of students think that universities sh should censor hurtful or offensive speech. 54% of students said that they had self-censored in class. Two-thirds of the students in one survey said that it was acceptable to shout down a speaker to prevent them from speaking on campus. And the most recent survey found that over one in four, 27%, say it is acceptable to use violence, to use violence to stop a campus speech. They also recently did a survey of faculty and what they found was that 72% of conservative faculty, 56% of moderate faculty, and 40% of liberal faculty are afraid of losing their jobs or reputations due to their speech. This is basically an identical survey that was conducted during the McCarthy era. And during that era, only 9% of professors said that they feared using their, losing their job or reputation because of their speech. Now, there's, uh, the survey is also um, perhaps alarming because this, in, if you look at the age breakdown and their willingness to, to censor speech uh, among faculty, uh, it tends to be younger faculty who are most willing to censor speech that they find offensive. So one in five faculty members under the age of 35 reported some level of willingness uh, of, uh, of having students using violence to stop a campus speaker. It was faculty. That was faculty. You also see this just reflected in what faculty say, that they think that uh, the speech of some other colleagues should be censored. Two professors, Michael Barabay and Jennifer Ruth, wrote a book called It's Not Free Speech, Race, Democracy, and the Future of Academic Freedom. And they argued that universities, direct quote, need academic freedom committees to di differentiate between professors' high value and low value speech and to determine whether a professor's beliefs can be at an extreme disqualifying. That is how we can maintain the academic integrity of academic freedom. Now you can imagine who would be uh, given the authority to decide what counts as high value versus low value speech. I'm certain that they expect to be in the position of making that judgment. 
Uh, fortunately, there are those who oppose this from across the ideological spectrum who recognize that this is a fundamental threat both to free speech and to academic freedom. I'm going to quote from Brian Leiter, philosophy professor and law school professor at the University of Chicago. He's very much on the left from what I can uh, glean from reading his blog. He's some kind of a mix of uh, Marx and Nietzsche, uh, so not exactly uh, 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 somewhere on the right. He, he would certainly disavow that. And he uses some language that I personally, I don't know that I would use, uh, but I will go ahead and quote him uh, in, in describing uh, their arguments for censoring faculty speech. Uh, talking in particular about Professor Barabay, he says, is Professor Barabay stupid or lazy or a bit of both? I really don't know, but people like him and Jennifer Ruth are a real threat to academic freedom from within the academy. Their stupidity or laziness is not a firing offense, by the way, but it is a reason for actual scholars committed to academic freedom to resist their nonsense and point out that they are clueless pontificators who do not speak for the academy or academic freedom. So, what are the threats? Uh, the, one, the primary ones, the, the things that I think are undermining free speech on campus today. First, protests. Uh, we see a lot of protests. Um, could pick any number of examples, but perhaps the most recent one that some of you might have seen was when a federal judge, Kyle Duncan, was invited to give a talk at Stanford University just this past spring, and students showed up to shout him down. Uh, they, fed, they, they, they said that his presence made them feel unsafe. I did find it a little bit unusual that someone who made them feel unsafe uh, wasn't so threatening that they didn't feel secure enough to go and yell at him. Uh, I, I, I don't know if, uh, if someone makes me feel unsafe, I try to avoid uh, that person. But they, they felt confident enough to go and try to shout him down. Unfortunately, this uh, heckler's veto, which I'll say more about uh, in, in a minute, was also essentially endorsed by an academic administrator. At, at Stanford. Her name was uh, Tyrion Steinbach, and she, came, she actually stood up and gave a little speech uh, about how she supports free speech, but not really. Uh, and uh, she said, this was her quote regarding free speech, you have to wonder, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the juice worth the squeeze? Is free speech actually worth it? Now, there's an important figure from American history who had addressed just this kind of situation where people try to exercise a heckler's veto, and that's, again, an attempt to shout down someone or to, uh, or to threaten violence as a way of preventing them from speaking. The person I'm thinking of is Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass. He tried to give a speech in Boston, uh, an anti-slavery speech in Boston in 1860, and he was shouted down by an angry mob. And then the next day, he gave an address, a plea for freedom of speech. And here's what he said. Liberty is mean, meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. To, to suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer, the people who have come to hear the person speak, and those of the speaker, and those of the speaker. And so we see this uh, unfortunately being practiced uh, on campus uh, today. Disinvitations uh, that sometimes can come from these kinds of threats as well, but sometimes just uh, people complaining. Uh, and this can sometimes lead to a, a formal withdrawal or just a resignation. So where someone says, it's just not worth it for me to show up. Uh, so about, I think, seven to eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago, Condoleezza Rice was supposed to be a commencement speaker at uh, Rutgers. And evidently her presence was so offensive that Condoleezza Rice had to withdraw from speaking at Rutgers. I found that truly unbelievable. Someone with uh, her career and her record uh, was just simply unacceptable unacceptable to a vast swath of the campus, uh, and so she had to, had to withdraw. Now, unfortunately, we can't tell the full effects of, uh, of these kinds of resignations, but we know they're broader than what we actually witnessed, because you see, one, it's going to, it's going to encourage others to not invite people that they think might be protested, uh, and then others simply might not accept because, of the, because uh, they fear this. Where else do we see it? Uh, speech codes, other threats, sp speech codes, free speech zones, sometimes bias response teams. Um, these also can have a chilling effect of, on, on, on speech on campus. I will say for public universities, a speech code is a very dangerous thing to have, extremely dangerous thing to have. Basically, if you have a, if you have a speech code uh, in your public university, there's a very good chance it's going to be struck down in federal court. I think to this day, every single one that has been challenged in federal court has been struck down uh, because 
Public universities are bound by the First Amendment. Public universities are bound by the First Amendment. Uh, and that means it's very difficult to write a speech code that's simply not redundant. That is that we know these things are not protected, these things are protected, please carry on. And uh, when universities go beyond that, they are essentially inviting litigation and they lose, they lose. Now private universities, we can say more about this, but someone put it to me, actually one of the founders of the Fund uh, Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression put it, public universities are bound by the First Amendment, private universities are bound by truth in advertising. <laughs> uh, and so they can do what they want. However, if they make a claim that they respect freedom of speech, uh, they better honor it because it, they can essentially create a contractual obligation uh, between uh, themselves and their faculty and their students. Where else do we see this? Uh, we also see a kind of language policing and also some what you could call modern loyalty oaths that uh, faculty have sometimes been required to, uh, to, uh, to subscribe to. So DEI statements, those kinds of things. But I'll just mention one kind of language policing that's going on. There's a, a substack called Heterodox STEM. They published an article uh, a few months ago where they, they just documented some of what's going on. And this is in the sciences. Uh, um, <clears throat> so here's what they said. The ever-expanding scope of what is considered offensive ranges from fundamental biological facts, such as the sexual dimorphism of humans, to everyday English words and phrases, dark times, webmaster, nursing mother, and the poor. One publisher says that they will not publish valid scientific research if it may be deemed harmful to groups or populations. So valid scientific research, we aren't going to publish if, if, if someone uh, alleges uh, uh, that it's harmful. Uh, others have even said that we shouldn't even uh, be allowed to talk about uh, research being rigorous. Uh, so two professors at University of Massachusetts, uh, Boston, in a presentation called Decolonizing Rigor in Higher Education said this, within the context of Western science, rigor presumes truth procedures that are precise, exact, conscientious, accurate, and objective. So apparently these are bad things now if you actually demand uh, precision, exactness, conscientiousness, accuracy, and objectivity. Now I would just invite you, the next time you get, in a, get on a plane, uh, to think to yourself, which one of those characteristics, what, one of those truth-seeking uh, uh, procedures, truth procedures, would you be willing to sacrifice in the engineers who designed the plane? Are we going to sign up for any of those? Some ob ah, we don't really need objectivity in the uh, <laughs> equations that they were running. <laughs> um, you know, um, precision, you probably want that. Or after tonight, you go get in your car. I'm guessing most of you would want some exactness and some preci precision and objectivity uh, uh, in the, the design and manufacturing of, of that vehicle. So that's another area where we see free speech threatened simply by trying to actually get at the truth more precisely. Um, another threat to freedom of speech on campus, I'll just call it constitutional ignorance. Uh, that is where people simply don't know what the Constitution requires and what the law requires. Uh, and the, this is often an issue on, again, public university campuses, which are bound by the First Amendment. So uh, we also see this, I think, all in, in the media and social media as well. And we can maybe talk about this more in the, in the Q&A. But there are two bedrock principles of contemporary free speech jurisprudence. Two bedrock principles. They are viewpoint neutrality, and that means the government cannot censor or punish your speech based on your motiv motivating ideology. And they're content neutrality. The other is content neutrality. So the government cannot censor or punish your speech based on its content, content except for a limited category of exceptions. Now, if you look at those exceptions to protection, there is one that is not in there that people very often think is in there. Offensive speech, or sometimes called hate speech. Uh, there is no exception to protection uh, for that. It is fully protected. This went so far as to even uh, show up, this ignorance showed up in chat GPT. Uh, a few months ago, I uh, asked chat GPT why hate speech was protected uh, under contemporary First Amendment doctrine, and chat GPT told me that it in fact was not. And it repeatedly told me this. I had to start quoting Supreme Court decisions 
where some justices actually said that it was protected, and it still persisted uh, in this ignorance. Now, I did go back a few weeks ago, and someone has uh, apparently tutored uh, chat GPT, <laughs> and it no longer makes this mistake, but it regrets the fact uh, that, it is, that, it is fully, that it is fully protected. You also see this on social media. There on Twitter, there is uh, one, one person has a Twitter handle called Bad Legal Takes, and I think you know somewhere between 25 to 50 percent of the bad legal takes uh, that are documented uh, uh, are ones that essentially assert that offensive speech is not protected uh, by, by the fir First Amendment. But you do find people uh, asserting that it's not protected, and therefore you can be pun you can be punished for it. Finally, finally, intellectual homogeneity, a lack of viewpoint diversity on campus. And this is where I will speak about some of my own research and how I think that it affects uh, this situation on, or at least on many camp campuses. So I wrote a book uh, with a friend of mine several years ago. It's called Passing on the Right, Conservative Professors in the Progressive University. Uh, and in what we did for this book is we interviewed 153 self-professed conservative or libertarian pr professors in the social sciences and humanities. We focused on the social sciences and humanities because politics is often more central to teaching and research in those disciplines. Now, the second person that we interviewed, uh, show up at his office uh, and says, what are you guys up to? Uh, and we told him, well, we want to interview about 150 self-professed conservative or libertarian professors in social sciences and humanities. And he looked at us and he said, what are you going to do, raise the dead? <laughs> he was right to ask. He was right to ask. Um, just to give you an idea, there are about 6,000 sociologists in the United States. 6,000. Uh, we found 12 who were willing to speak to us. 12. Then, actually finding professors could be very difficult in some disciplines. Economics, it wasn't terribly difficult. Political science, it wasn't that difficult. Other disciplines, we had to use what's called a snowball sample. Uh, and a snowball sample is where you ask someone who is in a difficult to locate population where you can find more people like them. Uh, so you find someone who's in, a, uh, in one of these populations say, I need to find 10 more people like you. Can you tell me where to go? Uh, the most common use of snowball samples, off, well, I, one of the most common uses of snowball samples is with the homeless. The homeless. Because they don't have a fixed address, maybe don't have a phone number, it's diff difficult, to, so that's how, you, that's how you find them. We had to use the same methodology to study the homeless, uh, to study uh, conservative and libertarian professors. Uh, now, you say, well, is, is there actually data on this? Yes. Uh, a survey from, it was about, about 2006, found that 18% uh, of social scientists self identify as Marxist. 18%. 5% self identify as conservative. 5% self identify as conservative. You can write your own jokes about there being more communists in faculty lounges than in China. Uh, if you think this is a problem, I'll try to make the case that it is a, a, a problem, it's getting worse. In 1990, the Higher Education Research Institute found that 41% uh, of professors were on the far left, 40% uh, were moderate, and 18% conservative. In 2014, that, those numbers had shifted to 60% being on the far left, 27% being moderate, and 13% being conservative. Now, I actually think the effective representation of political minorities is actually smaller on campus because they tend to engage in self-censorship. That's, in fact, what John Shields, my co-author, and I found when we interviewed conservative professors. We found that one-third of them hid their politics from their colleagues at some point in their career. Now, it's getting tenure tend to tended to change things uh, for some of them. Not all of them, but many of them uh, did start expressing their political views in the words of uh, Harvey Mansfield, a famous conservative political philosopher at Harvard. And he said they started hoisting the Jolly Roger uh, after receiving tenure. But many did not. Many did not. Now, uh, I can tell you some stories about how this affected their lives and their own sense of fear. So uh, we, we had a snowball sample. We would get names from people. And so then we'd just send them in emails out of the blue, unannounced, saying, hey, someone said that you might self-identify as a conservative or libertarian professor. Would you be willing to be interviewed? For many people, this was a deeply alarming email to receive. 
frightening. Terror would actually be the appropriate description for how some of them responded. We had to talk a few of them back from the ledge, <laughs> indicating that we came in peace uh, and we were just interested in their experiences. Uh, one of these professors, one of the most, one, ones who was most alarmed, uh, who's a sociologist, he refused to let us interview, he finally let us interview him, but he refused to let us interview him anywhere near his office. Nowhere near his office. We had to interview him in the middle of a botanical garden. <laughs> in the middle of a botanical garden. Uh, and you can actually, on the, on the recordings, you can actually hear his, his fear because you could hear, you, sometimes you'd hear footsteps and he would just stop talking. And then once the threat uh, had receded, he would begin speaking again. Uh, but that's how frightened uh, he was. So then the question is, even though there might be a few of these people who are uh, political minorities on campus, if they aren't willing to actually express themselves, what, 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 what difference is it, is it actually making? Now, I think that the uh, percentage that is higher, there's some research that was done by Eric Kaufman. He's a political scientist at Burbeck College at the University of London. He did a survey of professors in the English-speaking world, but we found with uh, US uh, professors, uh, he found that 70% of conservative professors self-censor. Self-censor. Well, then you have to ask, well, do they actually need to? Do they need to? Is this an unfounded fear? Are they, is, is it legitimate to be afraid of retribution uh, for having heterodox political views. And I think we do have significant evidence uh, that there are grounds for some of them uh, being afraid. George Yancey, a sociologist at Baylor, he wrote a book called Compromising Scholarship. And uh, he found uh, that uh, among the professors that he interviewed, half would be less likely to hire someone if they found out uh, that the person was a conservative Protestant. Uh, among sociologists, 30% reported that they would let, be less likely to hire someone if they knew that this person was a Republican. Another study by uh, Joel Imbar and Joris Lambers found uh, a similar willingness to discriminate among social psychologists. What they found was that 38% would discriminate against conservatives, and the most liberal respondents were the ones most willing to discriminate. Joel Imbar later expressed some surprise at this, uh, uh, at this finding, because, and this is what he said, Usually you have to be pretty tricky to get people to say they discriminate against minorities. And they felt comfortable saying this to researchers. So the number I might actually, the number might actually be higher. Well, why does this matter for universities? Why does this matter for universities? Why should we be concerned about it? And I I'm taking everything together here, but also in particular the uh, lack of uh, viewpoint diversity. The primary reason that I think this matters for the university is that universities cannot accomplish their mission or missions uh, without uh, healthy support for freedom of speech and the free exchange of ideas. I'm going to quote Daniel Deermeyer, who is the chancellor of Vanderbilt. He's on the board of fellows for the Institute of American Civics. I'll come back to him later as well. He said that free expression, open inquiry, and a wide-ranging debate are inseparable from our purpose of providing transformative education and conducting path-breaking research. The creation of knowledge demands challenging conventional wisdom. What's more, practicing thoughtful discourse not only makes for better students and greater innovation, it makes for better citizens. So in that quote, I think you see the two fundamental purposes of the university. First, that it should be a truth-seeking institution. And the only way you can be a truth-seeking institution is if you can freely call out what you regard as error. Otherwise, uh, positions become ossified, they turn into a kind of dead dogma. Uh, often this is because of what psychologists call confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is just the tendency that every single one of us, there's no one I think who's immune to this. Very, uh, the, the evidence uh, for, for this afflicting really all of us I think is overwhelming. But confirmation bias is the tendency that all of us have to accept evidence that supports our pre-existing beliefs and to discount evidence that uh, contradicts it. We all have this. So it doesn't matter. It's any group of people that all share the same politics, right, left, center, they would all be subject to confir confirmation bias. And so if you get these kind of intellectual cocoons, error can essentially go unchallenged. Error can go unchallenged. The second purpose of the university, I think, is to create citizens, create citizens and leaders. Uh, universities should be in the business of civic education. 
universities should model deliberative virtues, such as civility, toleration, and mutual respect. Uh, I think in particular, public universities should be preparing students to live in a pluralistic society. Uh, you're gonna go out into a broader world and they're gonna be people who, oh my gosh, they disagree with you. Uh, you need to be prepared to, to, to talk to those people. You can't isolate yourself. And you might say, well, does this actually happen? Are students actually um, not exposed to these different viewpoints? I'm gonna give an example from Jonathan Heights, um, social psychologist at uh, New York University, previously at Univer uh, University of Virginia. He wrote a book uh, several years ago called The Righteous Mind. The Righteous Mind. And in it, he describes something that happened to him. He actually, he went into studying psychology, he'll tell you, to try to help Democrats win elections. <laughs> that was his goal. To try, now, learn psychological tricks to help, help Democrats win elections. And he described being in a used bookstore in Charlottesville, Virginia, where he was already a tenured professor. Now, so here you have someone who has attended some of the most prestigious institutions in American higher education, was already a tenured professor, and he went through this um, used bookstore, and here's how he described it. He says, as a lifelong liberal, I had always assumed that conservatism equaled orthodox, orthodoxy, equaled religion, equaled space, which equals rejection of science. But then he came across a book uh, by Jerry Muller, an edited volume called Conservatism, an anthology of social and political thought from David Hume to the present. And, well, that's strange. Conservative thought? <laughs> it's kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> it's the thing as conservative thought, and it's kind of irrational biases or something like that. But, so he started reading. And so he said, I started reading Muller's introduction while standing in the aisle. But by the third page, I had to sit down on the floor. He said, I was quite literally floored <laughs> by the recognition that there was a kind of conservatism that could compete against liberalism in the court of social science. So Haidt says he, he did become a conservative, conservative, but he said, I did start to appreciate its, in, he started to appreciate its insights. I began to see that conservatives had attained a crucial insight into the sociology of morality that I had never encountered before. If this can happen, he went through his entire career without ever coming across these arguments. Jonathan Haidt never came across these arguments. Tenured professor, University of Virginia. If it can happen to him, it can happen to a lot of students. Now, I would invite you to imagine this happening in reverse. Could have happened in reverse. That is, could you imagine, say, a conservative professor wandering into a used bookstore and finding an anthology of progressive thought? And being like, oh, oh my goodness, I had no idea. These arguments were out there. I think, I think it's actually impossible to imagine. It's actually impossible to imagine. It's simply the world in which professors operate. So, I think that students who aren't exposed to these ideas, they don't have to agree with them. It's the last thing you don't you, I, The last thing I think that higher education should be, uh, uh, should just be an indoctrination factory. Uh, but they should be exposed to them simply so that they can be better citizens uh, once they graduate. So what can be done? What can be done? Well, the first thing that I, ha I think has to be done by universities is to bring people from different viewpoints into productive dialogue with each other so that universities can actually set the standard that the rest of the country they can look to and see that this is actually possible. It doesn't have to be the shouting that we all witness on cable news, the uh, digital shouting that we see on social media, uh, that we can rise above this. I also think that university leadership has an essential role to play in this. I'm going to go back to Daniel Deermeyer, Chancellor Vanderbilt. He wrote a very interesting article for Chronicle of Education, one that I quoted from just a few months ago. And he argued that universities need to emphasize freedom of speech. Three things they need to emphasize that all go together. Freedom of speech, first. Institutional neutrality is the second, and by that he means that university administration should not be putting its thumb on the scales of campus discourse. That is, they shouldn't be taking positions on every social and political issue that's out there, unless it directly, directly affects the operation of the university. They shouldn't be involved in it because that's gonna suppress uh, more discussion and dialogue. And then finally, civil discourse. You should show students that you can engage in civil discourse, and when you have civil discourse, I think that also means you get more freedom of speech because if people engage in civil discourse, they're more willing to come out of their shells, speak to each other, and engage in this kind of productive dialogue. 
Now, I want to close with a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville that I think should be both uh, worrisome for us, uh, but also should give us hope. So if you haven't heard of Alexis de Tocqueville, he's a French aristocrat, came to America to study the most egalitarian, egalitarian nation the world has ever seen up to that point. It's in the 1830s, and he went back to France and wrote a book called Democracy in America. And he wrote this in 1835, what I'm, about, what I'm about to read to you. I think it should sound familiar to you. It should sound like what people perhaps complain about today. But the reason it should give you hope is that it can show that we can actually move beyond this. Tocqueville recognized this as a problem in the very nature of a democracy. Here's what he said. I know of no country where there prevails in general less independence of mind and less true freedom of discussion than in America. In America, the majority draws a formidable ring around thought. Within these limits, the writer is free, but woe to him if he dares go outside of it. It is not that he has to fear being burnt at the stake, but he is exposed to all kinds of execrations and daily persecutions. A political career is closed to him. He's offended the only power which has the capability of opening it up to him. Everything is refused to him, even glory. Before publishing his opinion, he believed that he had partisans. It seems to him that he no longer has any now that he has opened himself up to everyone because those who condemn him express themselves loudly, and those who think like him, without having his courage, fall silent and withdraw. He gives in, he bows in the end before, beneath the effort each day, and he becomes silent again, as if he felt remorse at having told the truth. Chains and executioners, those are the crude instruments which tyrants formerly employed, but in our day civilization has perfected even despotism itself, which seemed to have nothing more to learn. So the choice, though, is ours. Tocqueville repeatedly emphasized, we don't have to go in this direction. We don't have to go in this direction of a kind of suffocating despotism of opinion. Instead, we can choose to build on our shared constitutional foundation that respects the, in, the dignity and the rights of all of us. Thank you. Josh, I'd really like to thank you for being here, for being part of this system, for really engaging and challenging the popular wisdom. And I think you're doing really, really, really important work. Uh, you know, and, and you know, and I've been thinking a lot. Needless to say, as a professor of uh, communication, um, I think a lot about free speech and, and the Constitution. And I was just in Washington, D.C. about a month ago, and I went to the archives. And what I noticed, there, there was the original drafts of the Constitution. How many strikeouts there were that the Constitution was and continues to be a work in progress. Free speech was a concept. We believe in free speech, but free speech at the time of the Constitution was limited to people who look like me. Free speech was not available to people of color or people with different genitalia. Free speech evolves over time. And it also defies labels. We talk about um, David Hume as a conservative who believes in free expression and free speech. Well, by the same token, what about liberal education? Does liberal education, the way I was taught, means exactly the same thing that you're talking about as a conservative viewpoint. So what I find is that these terms are imprecise. So I'll, I'll ask you, what is your definition of a, a conservative? And what's your definition of a liberal?
I mean, this is the point, you know. Like, I'm the discussant. Let's yeah, like so discuss. I'll tell you what we did in the book, we did not define them. Uh, instead, uh, anyone who's familiar with the debate over these categories knows that um, there's a lot of disputation surrounding their definition, and so you're going to uh, exclude people uh, if you say, "Well, this is what we mean by conservative." So what we did is we said, "Do you self-identify as a conservative or libertarian?" Uh, and we had, in part, what we're interested in is just who, who, who thinks that they're kind of on the outside politically, but, but on, on, on the right in, in higher education. And so we left it up, uh, up to them. And uh, again, this debate has been going on for, for forever. Uh, so you know, we aren't going to settle. John Shields and I weren't going to settle this, this definition. And by the way, think it, if you think it's difficult to define uh, conservative, ask a few libertarians right, what, what, what they mean about the word libertarian. Um, you know, it's, it's extremely difficult to get uh, a single definition. And so that was part of the enterprise. We were just kind of curious as to what their politics would look like. Like, you think that you're concerned, what, what do they look like? And so they gave a lot of different answers uh, from people who were extremely e economically libertarian and socially liberal to ones who were more economically moderate and pretty socially conservative. And then we asked them to give different name uh, labels for, for what they thought of themselves. So a lot of, you know, people call themselves classical liberals. Uh, some call themselves, I'm a reactionary. <laughs> you know, they just kind of owned it. Um, another person said that he uh, uh, subscribed to what he called Hobbiton conservatism uh, because he thought that in the Shire there was appropriate sense of order and deference. Uh, so, you know, they're all, so they're, all, oh, they're, they're all over the place. So I don't think it's actually our job to say this is actually what a conservative means. Again, these, category, these categories are, 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 are fluid. Uh, but so that's what, that's what we did in the book. Well, I, I really appreciate that, and people do self-identify. But the issue with self-identification is it occurs in context. Um, I worked uh, at, at Arkansas State University for a number of years, which is in Jonesboro, a very conservative area. However, we do preach diversity. In Arkansas, I have met gay people, feminists, environmentalists, but they are conservative Christians and don't you dare call them gosh darn it liberals. Because liberals are bad, even if I believe the same thing that a liberal in Massachusetts believes. So I, the, 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 the issue becomes the label. And when one labels oneself, you know, what do you, what are the implications for labeling you? I'm person X, therefore the other person's person Y. What, don't we run into, um, we're almost asking for conflict when we self-identify as X or Y, rather than Americans who believe in free speech? You know, and there is, some danger to that. And one other question. Okay. You talk about isolated populations. And yes, conservatives, self identified conservatives, might consider themselves isolated. Have you talked, what other populations, did you look at other populations who also might feel isolated? So no, we were we were studying uh, conservatives and libertarians. <laughs> That's what we mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and we we got p people say, well, why didn't you actually study business schools and law schools? And said, well, yeah, we. <laughs> it's only so much you can expect us to do and produce a product uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so we, no, we didn't we uh, we didn't look at every uh, conceivable population. But I will admit there are actually populations out there on the left now that are feeling very hesitant to actually express their views. Uh, and in some ways, I think what we found is that sometimes professors on the left that dissented from the campus orthodoxy actually faced more discrimination than conservatives because, after all, they should have known better. Uh, and apostates are the worst uh, rather than just heretics. Uh, and so um, I think that, yeah, I, so I think that is, I think it's worth, worth looking at. There are people who I think are doing some of that. By the way, I actually agree with the, the idea that these labels, conservative and liberal, don't capture a whole lot. 
great book just written by a friend of mine and his brother. It's called The Myth of Left and Right, How the Political Spectrum Misleads and Harms America. Berlin and Hiram Lewis highly recommend that you read it. What they show is that these labels, conservative and liberal, that there's nothing essential that binds mm -hmm. them together. Uh, that's it, that, uh, that instead it's a kind of tribalism. Uh, and so I, I fully, uh, yeah, I, I, so I have no problem with, uh, uh, with that. But nevertheless, people do sort themselves in these categories, and that was part of what we were interested in finding out, how they sort themselves, why they thought they fell where, where they did. You know, no matter what, we, however we self-identify, here at the university, and I agree 100% that this is a place where we all need to listen to one or another, to one another. There is, again, I study the Constitution and free speech. Um, there is no right not to be offended. The idea originally in free speech was the ability to speak truth to power. The problem is um, that there have to be some limits. And you can't as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, can't say fire in a crowded theater. Where do you, where do you think those limits should be? U U.S. versus O'Brien says when speech becomes action, that's where you can limit it. What about on campus? Are, what, what do you think are reasonable limits? You don't want to have riots. Uh, we have free speech zones right here on this campus. You can't walk into a class and protest. You have to, if you do want to protest, you can go right out in Chamberlain Field. Your right to express yourself is preserved, but you don't have the right to run into a class. Do you have any suggestions on where do you draw these lines? Yeah, so I'm actually very comfortable with where the Supreme Court has drawn them. Uh, so the, you have those basic uh, principles of viewpoint and content neutrality. And I think that the Supreme Court rightly has resisted uh, attempts to expand uh, the category of exceptions uh, to, uh, to protection. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. So what are some of the exceptions to protection under content neutrality? Obscenity, mm -hmm. uh, incitement to imminent lawless action mm -hmm. from Brandenburg versus Ohio, child pornography, mm -hmm. speech that's owned by others, uh, defamation, Fraud. These are some of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, exceptions to uh, exceptions to protection. So I'm very comfortable with how the court, and you actually see consensus on the court about this. It's the one area in constitutional law today where you see agreement across the uh, ideological spectrum with uh, with the justices. Now on campus, now you're right. Yes, you don't have a right to just run run into uh, to a classroom. Obviously, the university has to be able to conduct its business. Uh, but the, that also means the university, if it's a public university, has certain obligations. So, for instance, with student organizations, if you're a university, you probably shouldn't be engaging in viewpoint and content discrimination against, uh, against uh, different student organizations when it comes to access to campus resources, using campus facilities, recognition by uh, the student government, th those, those kinds of things. Okay. You know, I see it's kind of setting up. One more question. Okay. And, and then we're going to open it up. Well, I'm seeing that we can get started. You want to have other questions in the audience? I'm That's pretty much set. Give us, uh, let's see. And we do want people to queue up for our questions. We also may have some live stream questions. Mike's monitoring that. But does everyone see where the mics are? And again, if you'll just yeah, come on. have your question ready. Yeah, talk to us. Talk to us. Or and talk to them. We are, yeah, we're here to sponsor civil discourse and be an example thereof. And, you know, try to pull each other out and together so we can really find common ground at the same time as we can learn from each other from different perspectives. So let's, let's do it. Hi, thanks for come in and hosting an event like this. I think the dialogues like this are important. Um, I wonder if when you've studied this historically, if there have been other points in time where um, this sort of uh, 
issue has been raised, whether it's from a political ideology perspective or any kind of perspective where, I mean, you had mentioned gender and, and race and various things, but I, I, I mean holistically post-civil rights, post-suffrage, uh, if this has ever been an issue in American society, because I, 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 as a bystander, see a high correlation between the, uh, the post uh, academic, you know, university system becoming more of a, a brand and a corporatist welfare state for the faculty and, and administrators. Um, that has encouraged a, a lower bar for the IQ and intellectual prowess. Um, I think a secure person welcomes challenge and insecure people get triggered. So I'm just, yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering from your- and, and Just quickly, you say historically, like yeah. in American history at all? Well, I think we, I think we need to move past the, the gender and, and, and race uh, barrier, because you had valid points when, when you know, Bill of Rights and Constitution were first developed, we were evolved, but I'm talking post uh, university systems becoming blown out nationwide and, and less I Yeah, so I don't know, I'm still kind of, I don't know if you talk about the path because that's relatively recent, so. Could you please stand up oh. so we can see? Sure, so I, I, I mean, historically, there have been lots of examples where free speech has come under threat. Very early in American history, we had the Sedition Act, which essentially made it illegal to make fun of uh, elected officials. Um, Conveniently left off the list when the Sedition Act was passed was the Vice President. Uh, the Federalist Party was in control of Congress, uh, and the person who was the Vice President at the time was Thomas Jefferson, who they did not like. Uh, and so we, you actually had people thrown, including Benjamin Franklin's grandson, thrown in prison for, for making fun of John Adams. That's mm -hmm. essentially what happened under, under mm -hmm. the Sedition Act. We had a big debate over what the mean, of, and in my view, the proper side won out in the end. That was the Madisonian side, which is that in America, the people are sovereign, therefore it's inappropriate for the, for, for the, for the government, which is supposed to be our servant, to be telling the people what the people can and can't say. Uh, now then, you fast forward, and I have to say, I'm glad, even though I'm going to criticize it, Schenck versus the United States, while Oliver, Oliver Wendell Holmes made that horrible uh, 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 claim that you can't, I mean, wait, it's a horrible line. Yeah. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater, and the reason that's, uh, that's such a terrible line is because people think that then everything can be described as yelling fire in a crowded mm -hmm. theater. And therefore, all speech can be suppressed. And remember what Holmes was defending in Schenck versus the United States, he was defending throwing people who criticized the draft into prison. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, what he, that's what he was defending. So the court actually went backwards from what we had, I think, post-Sedition uh, Act. Uh, and eventually it got around to something closer uh, to what I think they, the, the First Amendment originally envisioned. Mm -hmm. So it's been out there and it's been challenged. We've had, had these debates. I just think that the court's done a pretty decent job uh, of kind of consolidating around uh, the most defensible understanding of uh, First Amendment. Uh, Could I, I would say something uh, rather, rather quickly about the questioner. I thought he brought a really good um, point about our local history, and it's very relevant to what we're talking about, about isolated groups. Certainly, there is a history in this city of people of color feeling less able to have their free speech. And that goes on today. Um, and, and maybe on campus, the impetus to try to give the voice to those who don't in the broader world might be something to consider. That doesn't mean those rights are any greater than a conservative person, but it, it, it shouldn't be either or. Um, uh, secondly, you talked about the corporatism and the business model that we face in higher ed. And you're absolutely right. We are, as su state support for public education has declined over the past 30 years, we've had to rely more on your um, tuition money. So it is more business oriented. Now, Josh, I'd like to ask you, um, how does that affect 
free speech. That we're becoming more business oriented in our uh, management of universities because of the economic issues. Well, I do think there's a tendency sometimes for uh, professors then to not lead students into a discussion that they, they're afraid might anger students because uh, if it's all tuition driven and if students are get, get upset about something, they leave, then you're going to, you can suffer consequence. Sure. I think that, that, that can happen. Also, administrators can be very, you know, can be very, sure. very concerned about this. Uh, but I can't say that I'm a complete expert on, on how this has worked its way uh, into the fiber of university. I do think you can under, see that there are some some potential ways that it could, could affect it. We've got three people in okay. the Okay, go for it. I'll tell you first, and then we'll turn to you. Yeah. We're presuming you're after both, but you might be after one. Yeah, he, he goes first. So I am just, like, kind of curious of, like, what way you think that free speech is being suppressed, because um, just in the examples that you gave, I feel like it was kind of contradictory about, like, being like kind of poking fun at the students who were like, um, you felt fearful about the Supreme Court justice coming to talk. And then we were supposed to feel compassion for the other, for the professor who said that he was fearful to talk, um, like in the conversation that you had. So I'm just kind of confused of like, um, I just feel like that's a divisive stance to have of like, you, um, Choosing who to show compassion to. So, okay, so I, and look, you know, what, what are the examples? Uh, uh, there are a lot of examples of of uh, people being violently silenced on campus. Uh, you look at Middlebury College. Uh, Allison Stanger was a professor was hosting a scholar named Charles Murray. She didn't agree with him, uh, and interestingly, he was there to talk about a book that he'd written called Coming Apart, uh, essentially how Americans had isolated themselves into enclaves where they didn't come across uh, people uh, who were really different from themselves. Um, and uh, it was essentially violence. Allison Stanger was actually, they had, to, they had to escort them into a back room. They had to try to sneak them out a back door. The protesters still found them. Someone found her, violently grabbed her by the hair and threw her to the ground. She ended up having a concussion. She ended up having to retire because of that. Uh, you see that, you've seen, seen many uh, e examples of that. Uh, the difference is, is that, look, those students at Stanford, they were not actually afraid. They weren't how, afraid. How do you know? Because they were there. <laughs> They're like, we're so afraid we're going to kind of come challenge yeah, you to they, your face. Do you not know yeah. the, the, the quote that's like, to have courage is to have fear and do it anyways. So, like, you can't say that. Yeah, yeah well, I, okay, maybe, you know. Just by it, rig, okay, I just, I, I'm highly skeptical that they're actually, because, again, uh, they, if you, there's actually video of this. Um, it did not look like a crowd that was actually afraid. They felt deeply empowered uh, to, to essentially try, try to ch uh, challenge him and silence him. And they were successful. They ended up having the power on their side. They silenced him. They had to, sh they had to shut, down, shut down the event. Uh, now, is that the, not yeah. their constitutional right to have that ability to do? No, that's called a heckler's veto. Uh, now, it's Stanford, so it's a private institution, but violates Stanford policy. But heckler's vetoes are presumptively unconstitutional. So, at a public university, this would be regarded as unlawful uh, because the speaker has a right to speak, and the people who are there to listen to the speaker have a right to hear that person. So, shout! You have a right to go protest, but somewhere else. But somewhere else, you aren't you don't you aren't entitled to go in and actually stop the event from occurring. That's not freedom of speech. That's called uh, minority tyranny. Uh, it's where someone gets to impose their preferences uh, over the rights of others. Okay. So what happened is yeah. that the students went in to block. Yeah. Sorry, I've got a question here. Yeah. Yeah. We have another yeah. question. Yeah. Here. Okay. Come up and ask questions. I know that originally racially we created censorship to protect the people who really were discriminated against, but now that we have self-identification, we struggle on who really is discriminated against and who we disagree with. So how do we learn to uncensor ourselves and those with different ideals? So I think, it, um, look, there's no doubt uh, that America was inconsistent in its uh, practice and application of its principles. There's no doubt about this. Uh, that doesn't make the principles wrong, though. 
uh, what it means is that America should do a better job trying to live up to those principles. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that that's the path forward, uh, that we recognize the rights of all, uh, recognize that America has uh, not uh, lived up to its, uh, its, its principles in the past and try to do better, try to do better going forward. Um, uh, so uh, that, that's, that's what I would say, that simply because uh, someone didn't um, practice what they preach doesn't mean what they, they had said was actually incorrect. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Uh, the question, please, your <clears throat> your As a self-identified libertarian professor, and by that identification, I mean somewhere between Ron Paul and Grover Norquist. <laughs> I, I go back to something you said earlier about you know, freedom of speech on campus going down to, is the university administration going to protect that or not? And the difference between that, say today and maybe 15 or 20 years ago, one of the big differences is the influence of social media on university administrators as well as many other people. It makes it hard or harder for them to stand up against the online mob who's trying to cancel someone for their speech than maybe it would have been some time ago. So should university administrators ignore social media or, or certainly pay a lot less attention to it because it seems to have an inordinate influence over lots of institutions, including universities. Could I answer that one quickly? Should we ignore social media? Yes. OK. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you stand up for the principle and protect it, regardless of what's happening on social media. But that's part of the reason I read that Tocqueville quote, because you, you, that quote, it sounds an awful lot like the social media mobs uh, that we see today, and where people end up being sh shouted down di digitally. And so it's not necessarily uh, new. I, I do think that this would apply to university administrators and anyone else, uh, that it turns out if you do stand up for your, for, for your principles, that you might, there might be uh, kind of short-term, uh, I guess, crisis you know, where people are attacking you, but it goes away pretty quickly. The mob has a um, short attention span, mm -hmm. and so it'll move on to the next outrage relatively soon. Um, this question is for both of you guys, but um, I was going to respond a little bit to your talk, Dr. Dunn. Um, it, it seems like you, you, you've spoken a lot about um, a, a climate and culture in, in academia um, that is stifling of, of speech, especially towards conservative viewpoints, and, and there's a culture um, that, that exists that, that's not as amenable to, to that. As, and, and you've done a really good job with, with presenting a lot of that, and I, I think that's really interesting. And I think it's a really important issue. Um, it seems to me that when we're speaking about the First Amendment, the, the, what the penultimate um, upholding of the First Amendment is the federal courts. And every time I feel like you've mentioned the federal courts, you, you seem to have applauded that the federal courts are upholding these sorts of things when they reach there. Could you speak a little bit more about some of the the problems that you've talked about at the ac academy and recently how some of these have, have played out in the federal court um, as positively or negatively um, as, as far as it pertains to if the First Amendment's under attack, if it's being supported in the, the yeah, court no, system. No, again, so I think that constitutional protections for freedom of speech are more extensive than they have ever been. Uh, but I think what you see is that you, can't ha you can have constitutional protections of freedom of speech without having a culture that respects mm -hmm. and supports freedom of speech. And I think you need to have both. Uh, but you, the, the courts uh, have been pretty good on this. Uh, and there have been cases, and it, you can see a lot of, if you're interested in this, you can go to the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Now, they were started to essentially sue universities. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why they were created. And all they did was win. <laughs> That's a, I mean, it was a really bad day if you got a letter from file. Uh, yeah. And now all it takes is just a letter. It used to be they'd actually have to go into court, but now it's like, if you get a letter from fire, administrators say, huh, well, you know, guess we were wrong. Um, 
and so it's it's it is much 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 improved on that. But if you can go look at some of the cases that they've taken on, they involve academics from across the ideological spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's not just conservatives, right? It just tends to be that because conservatives are probably the the biggest political minority that you might have more cases. But there are plenty of professors on the left who have been subjected to unconstitutional mm -hmm. point, censorship of their and punishment because of their speech. Mm -hmm. uh, but the courts are pretty good. The problem is, is that even if you want to vindicate your rights in court, um, that's time consuming, it can be expensive, uh, and sometimes people uh, just that's decide right. that it's not worth, worth, yeah. worth the time yeah. you, uh, it, and effort and so they just a, it, it does take time and expense and knowledge that you have a, a, a case. Uh, I, I want to ask you related to what you're, you're uh, talking about. Um, you noticed that younger faculty are more likely to support um, censorship across the board, no matter what their ideology. What What do you think that's about? Where does that come from? Uh, well, I I don't know. <laughs> um, I I mean, I have lots of speculation. I actually think a good place to start with this is a book written by Jonathan Haidt, another book mm -hmm. called The Coddling of the American Mind that he co-authored with Greg Lukianoff, who was the president of, of FIRE. Uh, and they identify a lot of things going, going even to just how children are reared today, uh, the excessive mm -hmm. protection surround, uh, surrounding them. Uh, and then this uh, manifests itself in their just inability to actually deal with conflict. Uh, and so you don't have unstructured play. I actually think this is, there's something to yeah. this. That unstructured play is crucial for, for people to learn how to resolve conflict together. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a lot of kids today, there's no unstructured play. It's just they're taken from one event to the next uh, and they've never actually just been in an environment where they have to learn to get along with their peers without an adult hovering over them and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, imposing the law on one side or the other and resolving the situation. Thank you. Okay. Deborah, you have a question? Um, um, so, I was just, so about a year ago, there was a revival of a Broadway show called Parade that tells a true story of a Jewish man named Leo Frank in the early 1900s. And when they were at the city center in New York for their previews, there were many neo-Nazi protesters during the show. And I was just wondering what your opinion on this is and like your connection to like guidelines of freedom of speech and stuff like that. Yeah, so uh, I don't like neo-Nazi protesters, uh, but the constitution applies to them. Yeah. And you see the Skokie case from Illinois. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can go, go read about what happened there. Uh, and um, I think what you, can, what you see is that often if you just, it, uh, what, what you, what they really want is to provoke a response. Uh, and if you don't give them that response, they end up going away. Uh, this is how it happens with this group, the Westboro Baptists, where they go and protest all the time. And they're just looking for someone to do something that's gonna show up on film that they can get, take, take into federal court and just, um, just ignore them, mm -hmm. just, just ignore them. Uh, now, so they do have, con if it's in a, what's, uh, a traditional public forum like a sidewalk, they're allowed to be there to be saying the things that they want to say as offensive as, as they are. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so you just, you, you, have, you, have, you have to tolerate it. But I do think that if you tolerate it and you don't give them what they want, um, then they get disappointed and kind of I slink a, off into the shadows. I got a related question to that. You mentioned about how it's a university's responsibility to support all viewpoints. And in general, I agree, but is there a, is, is there any system or protocol of deciding what speech is more supportable than other? For example, should a, a neo-Nazi group or the a studies that say minorities are not the same intellectually as white people. Do we give, on a university level, that same, um, that, that same level of support as we do 
refereed research that we have done that is nobody's arguing with. So I think the question is what you mean by support. As I don't think the university, this is why I think institution, institutional neutrality is important, that I, it's not the job of the university to decide what, instead there's obligations, particularly for, for public universities, uh, to respect the free speech rights of everyone. Uh, and it's not the job of the university to support uh, it one way or the other. Now, disciplines can, of course, have their professional standards for what constitutes appropriate levels of rigor. Uh, and so that's perfect, per, you know, perfectly legitimate. The danger, though, is that you can get um, ideology woven sometimes into the nature of what counts as is uh, as appropriate uh, yeah, as appropriate uh, research, but I so I, I'm just not certain what what support is actually because I, I just don't like the idea of saying well universities have to support it. Instead, universities just have a, an obligation to to respect again the 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 a academic freedom and the First Amendment rights of, of everyone if they're public if they're a public university. Mm -hmm. and, again, private universities they can do whatever they want. Just be tr truthful about it. Be honest about it. Mm -hmm. Questions. Questions. Please, you still got about uh, 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Welcome. I, I would like more students to come up. So if you, if you kids have anything, come on. We, we want to hear more from you. Uh, I guess I could just ask uh, uh, for both of you. Um, with the First Amendment being not just tied to speech, but also religion, right? Freedom of religion, the exercise thereof, right? Uh, some, Aaron, there's a, I believe, philosopher, a Christian writer, Aaron Wren, if you've heard of his mm -hmm. uh, three uh, worlds of, of uh, Christian, I think it's three worlds of evangelicalism. It talks about how in our society today, we have entered a negative world towards Christian viewpoints in many ways. And he talks about how it's now more of a liability in some areas to be a Christian. And so my question with that is, how do you delineate between the religious context of the First Amendment and free speech and say, I feel like some of the questions around what kind of speech should be restricted ultimately goes back to the religious nature of all societies, right? Mm -hmm. and the fact that there are like blasphemy laws in all religions and things like that. So how do you delineate that? Because I feel like if Christianity is on the downside and secularism is on the up, we're just entering into some kind of okay. you know, new And that's restrictive. a real good question in our local context. The first part of the First Amendment is the Establishment Clause, that the government will not establish a state religion. And the reason for that is because the, uh, the framers came from the English tradition. And in England, you had civil wars between um, Protestants and Catholics and just you know, Quakers. Well, Quakers wouldn't fight. But no, but, but you did have religious wars that ended in great casualties. And one of the things that this country was founded on is we're not going to go there. We are going to be a country of laws, not religion. And that brings the second part of the First Amendment. You have the right to do your religion. We're not going to decide for you. So yeah, they decided that this is going to be a secular country. And as a secular country, you are allowed to be a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, and the government's not going to get into it. The problem is, does a nativity scene at Christmas time in the town hall, is that the establishment of a religion? Supreme Court says, yes, it is. Can't do it. But that is one of those concepts that we have been wrestling with applying since the beginning. And that's what this country is founded on. Sure. So uh, the, the, 
the phrasing in the First Amendment is kind of peculiar. It says, shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And it's clearly designed to prevent it from adopting a national church. Mm -hmm. uh, but guess what we had in the United States until the 1830s? Official state churches. Official state churches into the 1830s. Uh, and so you go back and read the debates over the First Amendment. The reason it has this language is that they're also trying to insulate, particularly New England state churches. That's where we had them, where the Congregational Church was the official state church in, in, in many. So that's why that's why it has this kind of uh, peculiar phrasing. The other thing I would say is that the Supreme Court's Establishment Clause jurisprudence has been a nightmare for decades, and everyone has acknowledged this. The uh, the difficulty is that no one agrees on what they should do to fix it. Yeah. Uh, but there was a great, there was a great line from a Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals judge who said, "We're called upon to uh, apply the Supreme Court's Establishment Clause jurisprudence, a vast, perplexing desert." Uh, look, if if Article Three judges can't make sense of it, what hope is there for mere mortals like us? Mm -hmm. uh, now the court has moved away from some of the, the problems that it's created with it with its jurisprudence. I think there's some cl uh, some clarity, but the thing, you know, it's like. The, the nativity scene, that stuff, that, you know, part of that came out of what's known as the endorsement test, and that meant came from O'Connor, who said you shouldn't be able to, the government can't do anything that signals to outsiders, uh, uh, or to those with dissenting dogmas that they're outsiders. And then the question, well, how much, you know, so, so you can have a nativity scene, but, you know, you have to have enough, enough other stuff, too, so that it sig symbol, uh, signals enough pluralism. Well, how much is that? No one knows. Uh, so people called it jokingly the three, uh, two Rudolphs and a Frosty rule. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, so if you have a nativity scene better, you know, have like some plastic reindeer uh, or something like that. Uh, so that being said, what is also interesting is that a lot of what would have been uh, re religion clause jurisprudence starting in about 1980 because a case called Widmar versus Vincent became free speech jurisprudence, mm -hmm. where uh, religious speech had been suppressed because it was religious speech because people were applying the Supreme Court's Establishment Clause uh, jurisprudence. And so it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, oh, it turns out there's no bracket uh, in the free speech clause that says, except for religious speech. So religious speech is, free, is speech, and full stop, it, therefore it's protected. Uh, and so there's a whole line of cases, uh, and we're talking eight to one, nine to nothing opinions by the Supreme Court, where they were striking down the, uh, uh, sometimes what universities did, that's what happened in the uh, Widmar versus Vincent case, sometimes what K through 12 schools had done, uh, and because the Supreme Court's free speech jurisprudence, in contrast to its establishment clause jurisprudence, is pretty clear. Like, I just explained to you basically what it is. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it's, you know, people can understand it. Yeah, and certainly, you know, you don't, you don't have to, no, no, no genius level uh, of, uh, of knowledge is required to understand the free speech jurisprudence. Uh, so that's been interesting that there's been a lot of cases that you could have imagined as religion clause cases just turned into free speech cases. So one thing that um, came up at the, at the beginning was this was the research about um, you know self censorship uh, fear um, and but also the the inclination of students to report um, and it, and it seemed and it also came up the bias uh, incident response teams which it would seem to further facilitate this kind of behavior. Um, incentivize it, thereby further chilling speech. I don't know if, if you have any, if you have any uh, data, or if, if that's. I was going to ask Josh, is, is that your view? And I guess to Professor Ziblick, um, should we eliminate the bias uh, incident response team here at UTC if we all agree that indeed we believe in free speech and that we ought not to chill it on campus? Cool. So I think it has to have some chilling effect on it, and there have been challenges based on other. Well, sometimes universities will have speech codes and they'll say, and they're clearly unconstitutional. <laughs> clearly unconstitutional. They're overbroad, uh, they violate viewpoint and content neutrality, et cetera. And the university said, well, look, these are just as aspirations for us. We just aspire to create this kind of culture on campus where these things are, are respected. Courts have still struck them down because they create a chilling effect. 
uh, because you never know if you're going to be, they'll say, we aren't going to punish anyone for violating this, but you never know if you're going to be the first one punished. Uh, so I think there, there's something similar go, uh, 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 go, going on there. As well, sometimes universities say, well, we just investigate these things. There's no, there's no uh, punishment that results for, uh, from them. But it, often the process is the punishment. Uh, and so people engage in self-censorship because they don't want to have to go through a series of hearings uh, mm -hmm. where their character That's can true. be besmirched uh, as, a, as a result of these. So I think there, there has to be at some level some kind of chilling effect on speech. Yeah. No, you're good. So we know that with the First Amendment, one of the, the main reasons that the, the founders felt so strongly about the, the need for the freedom of speech was to be able to be a way of, of, of being able to provide an educational outlet for the public to be able to have a, a marketplace of ideas where those, all those different ideas could be discussed in, in a civil discourse, at least at that time. What about what we see that has happened, and I would say, that it seems to me that has come out recently at least that the government even served to go to get in league even with the social media sites to shut down specific kinds of speech that they did not specifically agree with. And I'm, and I'm just referring especially for right now in the wake of all the COVID stuff and all this is coming out now that yes, the government actually did go to the social media sites and say, we don't want that stuff out there. We don't want it heard. We want it shut down. So how, how does that? <laughs> yeah, so in general, I think that private uh, organizations should be able to establish their own policies right. uh, in the same way that you have your house. You don't have to let someone that you think is uh, sure. obnoxious and offensive come in and just walk into your house and say, free speech, I get to say whatever I want in here. <laughs> so I think that that's true of social media companies. There's a difference, though. Right. Uh, and this could have happened. We'll wait for the litigation. Uh, exactly. But uh, from what I've seen, it looks like there might be a decent case, yeah. which is that if the government recruits you to engage in something that the government could not do on its own because it violates the First Amendment, uh, then you have essentially been transformed into a state actor. And, mm -hmm. uh, and for First Amendment purposes, then you might have oh, engaged yeah. in unconstitutional censorship. Okay. That's the question. That's Whether or not it's happened, we'll have to wait for all well, the there facts you go. to come out. It's really incumbent upon the, the entity that has been censored to say, my free speech has been violated. You have to be willing to take that to court. Um, I would be very surprised if a, um, if a large social media company with lots of resources would just roll in and let a government agency say, oh, can't do that. Uh, I, I just would be surprised. Well, so that's the question. It did, it did appear that there were actually requests from the FBI to, to oh, like Twitter, okay. to actually shut down uh, uh, or, or to, to remove certain posts uh, uh, re relating to COVID. And again, we don't, this hasn't gone through a full, uh, really legal discovery yet. So we, I, I want to see yeah, the full context know, yeah. of these. But well, what's been presented, it does look like there was at least an attempt to do it. And it, it is, it's, it, yeah. to me, it's actually strange that uh, Twitter would even have an office that is there to just answer the phone when the FBI calls for those kinds of things. Uh, now, uh, if it's related to you know, national security, terrorism, yes, please. Right? But they, they had a more, uh, it, it, it yeah. does look like they had this kind of relationship where the, all sorts of stuff was being, well, we don't really like this. It seems to appear to be disinformation. So that, was, that struck me as very misguided on their part, right. if, if it turns out to be true. If it turns out to be true. Yeah. And I have got nine, and my reputation rises or falls, but stay, <laughs> stay. We have, a, we have a good news for you, questioner who's going to, to, to sit down, but I must honor the, the 7.30 to 9, and I'll just say two things. I think you saw a good model tonight of civility. Mm -hmm. For everybody. And I'll say a second thing. <laughs> a, second, a second thing is, you students, don't be afraid. Yeah, we love it. Yeah, we love it when the students come, 
And here's the good news for the not. questioner who was disappointed. Both speakers have agreed to stay around and informally answer questions. Just every, everyone who's had enough can leave. But if you want to stay, you can for 20 minutes. And thank you for coming.